All right, so the video is not working, but I'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anita, AKA CBD Genie, and I will be your MC for the Texas Normal Virtual Open Meeting this evening. Everyone is gonna be coming to you live from our own homes due to the current circumstances with the coronavirus 19 or COVID-19. I wish I could say April Fools after that, but unfortunately, here we are. This virtual meeting is live streaming and will be recorded. Before I get started, I would like to say how grateful I am to all the essential employees on the front lines of this pandemic. During this time, it is important to stay positive, fuel yourself with nutritional value, practice good hygiene, and social distancing. Thank you all for tuning in this evening. Reminder, this virtual meeting will be live streaming and recorded. Want to give a shout out to Jax, Texas Normal Executive Director and the crew for providing the time and the space to keep this conversation going. Once again, I am Anita aka CBD Genie. And for the new viewers or listeners, a quick intro, I am an Air Force veteran. So shout out to all the veterans out there. Fun fact, both of our special guests today are Army veterans. I'm also a 12-year medical professional, cannabis science communicator, and currently creating a safe place to educate smart, organic, sustainable practices while giving back to the farm to table community and bringing ourselves and Mother Earth to balance. So the agenda tonight, we are going to have Dr. Jillian Jones, an Army veteran, uh, neurologist and cannabis physician. She's gonna be sharing her personal cannabis testimony uh, and she's also going to be sharing patient testimonies for a variety of disorders and diseases. She will also sprinkle what cannabis legalization could bring to the state of Texas and how it could start to shift the dominant paradigm of the medical industrial complex into an integrated holistic healthcare system. Our next guest is Mr. Joshua Jones, also an Army veteran, co-founder of In Solidarity and co-owner of Redemption Farms Cannabis Grow. He's gonna be sharing his cannabis and healing testimony from post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury from the wounds of Afghanistan and Iraq. Not to mention uh, regenerative agriculture and key issues and composting. After that, we're going to have Jack Spinkle, the executive director of Texas Normal, updates with current events. She's going to be getting us in the know. And then finally, we will have questions and answers at the end, 15 to 20 minutes, questions and answers. And if you notice, there's a tab, a Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen for you to submit questions. So let's see if I can get my video on here. Boom, let's go. All right, yay. So now I'm on here, yes. All right, so right now, you guys, more than ever is the time. It's important to have an outlet uh, with the goal to bring your body to balance and release all those positive neurotransmitters within the body. For example, you already know all the transmitters that I'm talking about. Dopamine, the pleasure neurotransmitter, serotonin, the mood, endorphins, euphoria, GABA, the calming neurotransmitter. Anan but please don't forget the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2AG. They are the neurotransmitters that are happening within our body, bringing us to balance. So while there are many outlets, there's a, there's a whole bunch of outlets out there uh, to bring your nervous system to balance, but I have taken on the personal commitment to go after 12 years and working in the lab 
to going outside and working with Mother Earth and vibing with Mother Earth and really getting to know her. So, you know, the saying like, you can take the girl out of the lab, but you can't take the lab out of the girl because after working in the microbiology department for over seven years, it gave me an entirely different perspective because think about it, for example, if you put a tiny little drop on a slide and you magnify it 10 times or magnify it 40 times or even 100 times on that tiny little drop, there's a whole nother world under there and you're seeing thousands of organisms. So I couldn't help but wonder, how is that in the soil, right? Because I love to parallel living organisms and soil is very much alive. So can you imagine the millions of organisms that you would find in just one scoop of holding soil in your hand? So then my question began, if we are more microbiome than we are human cells, and we have our normal flora that helps maintain balance because our normal flora is all over the systems of the body. It's our normal flora is on our skin, in our respiratory tracts, in our digestive tracts. And these organisms, they work with our bodies to keep us balanced and keep us healthy, right? So then I was thinking, are there beneficial micro microbes in the soil? And the answer is yeah, of course, of course, yes, there's millions of beneficial microbes in the soil. And that's the beauty of having that understanding of life at a smaller scale, right? So just like the normal flora keeps us balanced, the beneficial microorganisms in soil also help boost nutrient mineralization, generate plant growth and actually keep pests and disease and just parasites at bay. So it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So yes, I'm talking about microbiomes, but it, but it doesn't end there with the soil. There's also the elements. So let's bring the periodic table into this, right? So have you ever been to the doctor done some blood work and been deficient in an element. Personally, I have after going in and out of the hospital and dealing with my ulcerative colitis issues, I personally have been deficient in iron. I've been deficient in magnesium, vitamin D, which is responsible for the uptake of calcium, right? So when you're deficient in elements, like how example, like how I was, you're, you're off balance. So you're, you're not well, you're, you're, you're ill, right? So with that in mind, it's the exact same thing with the soil. There is a variety of elements in the soil, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, just to name a few. And if your soil is deficient, then it's just like you and I, then it's not healthy. And then whatever crops that you put into the soil will not yield a beautiful crop because the soil that it started in wasn't healthy to begin with. But there are beautiful ways to take care of that. And phytoremediation is the way that I would like to state. For example, if you're deficient in nitrogen, using a cover crop to get that nitrogen fixation with maybe some clove or pea, right? Legumes, the beans, right? There's a beautiful balance and Mother Earth working together that is just such an amazing thing that I've been just playing around with. Because just like the body has an innate ability to heal itself, so does Mother Earth. All you have to do is provide and then the Mother Earth will take care of herself and she, kn she knows what she's doing. Um, and it's a beautiful thing right now that during this time with quarantine and everything, Mother Earth is able to come back to balance. You've seen the stories about 
personally, I lived in Italy. I've been to Venice many times and I could never even imagine being able to see fish in that water. That, that was not true when I lived there, but to see how beautiful the world, Mother Earth is finally growing and coming back to life, right? So I just wanted to parallel our microbiome with the soil's microbiome. I wanted to parallel the elements in the body with the soil and the elements in the soil. Because if you have everything balanced synergistically, then that's when the beauty and the symbiosis, us taking care of the land, and in turn, the land will take care of us. So gardening literally changed my biochemistry sending off and triggering all those sig the, the signals for those positive neurotransmitters keeping me happy and balanced so i wanted to share that with you all if you're not doing that already maybe give it a shot but speaking of nervous the nervous system our first guest speaker is a neurologist and cannabis physician my friend dr Jill, uh, jillian jones she grew up in Colorado and received her Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Dance from the University of Arizona. She danced professionally and taught for many years in Chicago, Arizona, and Colorado. She worked in a translational research lab for two years at the University of Colorado prior to attending medical school. She received her doctorate of osteopathy from Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine in 2014. She completed her neurology residency at Madigan Army Medical Center in 2018 and is board certified to practice general neurology. She served in the US Army from 2010 to 2019 and is a proud veteran. Currently is practicing cannabis medicine in the states of Oklahoma and Missouri via telemedicine with Elevate Holistics. Everyone clap so she can hear you, <laughs> Dr. Jones. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, uh, first off, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Jones, um, but I prefer to go by Jillian. Uh, I am a neurologist, a practice can practicing cannabis physician, an army veteran, an artist, a mother, a wife. But most importantly, I'm, I'm just a human like all of you with very similar physical and emotional responses to likely very different human experiences and environments. I'm really thankful to have the opportunity to talk with all of you tonight. This is the first time I've ever spoken at something like this before and definitely my first virtual speech. Um, it's quite nerve wracking as any speeches with the shaky hands and the pounding heart. Um, but it's also quite comforting to know that I could quickly escape by just closing my browser or uh, or pants if I didn't want to, <laughs> or uh, I was also, it was funny, I sprayed a little perfume on myself, and then I'm like, I don't really need to do that, this is virtual, but um, anyways, uh, new experience for me. Uh, I would like to talk with you tonight about a handful of different things. Um, please bear with me as some of what I say may first may seem at first irrelevant to my overall thesis, but we need to remember that the personal is always political. Our personal stories translate into major political issues. We're all here tonight because of an incredibly important political issue, and that's marijuana legalization, not the coronavirus. Uh, just a, a little reminder. <laughs> um, we have all been touched by cannabis in various ways, be it for the beautiful medicinal, recreational, and spiritual properties, or sadly and most unjustly because of legal ramifications. By legalizing medical cannabis here in Texas, it could begin to shift the dominant paradigm of our current profit and productivity driven medical system into an integrated holistic healthcare system that honors the patients as having innate wisdom of and autonomy over their bodies 
while giving the physicians a chance to practice medicine in a more wholesome, compassionate, and humanistic way. First off, though, I would like to give you a little more background about myself in terms of my life story and how I got here with marijuana. I was born the youngest of three daughters into a working class home. Uh, my dad worked a lot and was therefore frequently absent, both physically and emotionally. My mom, while she was physically present, did not provide a very healthy sense of emotional safety. And it was a home in which you frequently questioned your own sanity and reality. I have a strong genetic predisposition to anxiety, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder, but we can't forget just how critical our environment and our learned behaviors are in the shaping of us as humans. I grew up in a home where achievements were praised, emotional expression was often shamed, and with a mother who was terrified of virtually everything and that somehow, some way, nearly everything could kill you no matter how ridiculous the mechanism. Given my already primed brain chemistry at the age of seven, when my dad left for a military school for nine months, I developed disabling OCD and anxiety that has never gone away through life, only fluctuated in severity. To the people around me in the outside world, I have always been viewed as doing great and thriving. Growing up, I was always a straight A student. I danced six to seven days per week, worked out at the gym at least five days a week. I was a yes girl and always went above and beyond at the expense of my own health. You get it. My life was regimented and I worked myself to the ground. To me, uh, how I experienced my upbringing when reflecting back was that love was conditional on perfection and performance. I saw firsthand how my middle sister was praised as she always towed the line and was also an Olympic level gymnast. Whereas my oldest sister was often shamed and cast away as the problem child, the selfish one. And she was not as regimented as my middle sister though still worked very hard. You would imagine, as any human, where self-preservation is always a subconscious goal, I too towed the line and ultimately many years later it would catch up with me in the form of a deep depression as I drifted farther away from my true essence and my soul. I started dance at a very young age and that was what I did my whole life. I truly believe that having that artistic outlet was my saving grace, as it wasn't until I was in residency and no longer able to dance due to the demands of the work that my depression really came to a head. During my final years in college, while getting my fine arts degree in dance, I decided I wanted to go into medicine. I felt a real calling towards the profession, and it was a passionate calling. I would become emotional thinking about becoming a doctor, not because of the title or the status that came with it, but thinking about connecting with and caring for patients and making real change. I had no clue of just how dehumanizing the field of medicine and our healthcare system actually is. Somehow I thought it would be different for me, despite nearly all doctors I ever worked with, much less simply encountered, giving me a firm warning to steer clear of the profession and saying things like, why don't you just stick with dance? I remember being so offended by that initially, taking it personally, that somehow I was inadequate of becoming a doctor, but now I see they were truly looking out for me in my best interests. I was drawn to the osteopathic philosophy and tenets, which are based upon an understanding that the human is composed of a unified body, mind, and spirit with the innate capacity to self-regulate and self-heal, that structure and function are interdependent on each other, and that the physician, with their knowledge and analysis of the whole patient, including their socioeconomic, cultural, genetic, and environmental factors, will be able to determine proper treatment. Throughout medical school, I then found a passion in neurology, a field to me that is just fascinating and beautiful, and one that provides a nice balance of science and enigma. I did my residency at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. It was hard and grueling in many ways, but what always made the work worth it were the patients and their stories and connecting with them and their families. However, that can only go so far. I became so disheartened by the realities of what practicing medicine really looked like in the system. And the military was undergoing a change to a market-based approach, removing nearly all autonomy that a physician might have over their way of providing good and safe patient care. It was nothing like what I had imagined and the osteopathic principles that resonated with me deeply were not able to be realistically implemented given the other demands. I was not immune to the negativity and dehumanization and no amount of mindfulness or po positive psychology could save me, though I did try. 
a deep depression brewed and festered over the nine years of medical school residency and practice, though it took me years to realize that what I was experiencing was actually depression. Anxiety and OCD had always been my close companions that protected me and helped me excel in all my endeavors while simultaneously crippling me from truly living my life. In addition to the psychological pain, I had daily excruciatingly painful migraines and neck pain for five of the nine years. I tried numerous medications, treatments, counseling, antidepressants, of course, with no success or reprieve from the pain. Fast forward through time, I think you have a pretty good idea of the severity of suffering. I never deployed while in the army. However, for me and for my experiences, the garrison environment was just as traumatizing. I was medically retired from the military for migraines, depression, and PTSD. And after my exit from the army, I started to use cannabis. I had only done it a few times in my earlier days. <laughs> and when I had, I consumed far too much and experienced intense anxiety and paranoia. So I was somewhat skeptical that it would work for me. I also grew up in a home where I was never once exposed to it. However, thankfully, my husband used it for his medicine, and I saw over the years how it provided so much relief for his conditions that are both physical and emotional in nature. Simultaneously, while learning to medicate with cannabis, I started to do my own research on marijuana and our endocannabinoid system, which I will refer to as the ECS from here on out. I was immediately blown away at the functions and intelligence of the ECS. I've also had some intense frustrations and anger about the fact that in eight years of training and quote education, never once is the ECS discussed. Not in medical school and not once in a neurology residency, which is absolutely insane when the cannabinoid receptors are the most abundant of all throughout our nervous system. I just couldn't believe it. This is a huge problem for the continued progress in the movement of cannabis legalization. Our physicians and our politicians must be educated on the ECS and the value of cannabis as medicine in order for us to make progress here in the state of Texas. If you aren't familiar with the ECS, I will discuss it briefly. As I have mentioned before, our bodies have the innate capacity to heal and restore balance, structure, and function. The ECS is critical in maintaining that balance. It works in concert with nearly all of our other systems and organs, the most critical being our nervous system. The main function of the ECS is to bring our bodies into a state of homeostasis or balance and to promote repair and recovery. Our bodies create their own internal cannabinoids, but over time as we live life and encounter stress, disease, trauma, etc., our own internal storage of cannabinoids becomes depleted. And that is where consuming cannabis as medicine comes in and helps to restore that system that has become deficient over time so as to bring our body back into balance. Thinking about my own self and what I had put my body and mind through over 36 years, I knew that I must have significantly depleted my own ECS, not to mention the strong genetic component in which research has shown there to be deficiencies in the ECS of people who have disorders such as migraine, depression, PTSD and other neurologic and psychiatric disorders. It didn't take long for me to start to experiencing to, to start to experience the life-changing positive effects that cannabis had on my overall health. I wasn't having migraines on a daily basis, my neck pain was drastically reduced, I had more energy, my mood was uplifted, I was more patient. But for me, the most freeing aspect was what it has done for my anxiety and OCD. It used to feel like my mind was a prison in terms of the constant fear, worry, and being consumed by irrational thoughts that take you down a rabbit hole of suffering until you feel physically sick. To me, it feels miraculous, like a second chance at this life. Cannabis has returned me to my soul and my true nature. It's as though that default network that my brain has been in since I was at least seven years old finally found a new route, <laughs> finally. Um, one that is grounded in reality and not in constant fear or competition or need to please others. Armed with this knowledge and a newfound passion, my path crossed some folks starting a new telemedicine company in Oklahoma and Missouri, providing medical marijuana recommendations. Since I've been working with Elevate Holistics, I've seen just over 2,000 patients and wish I would have kept a greater tally in terms of specific numbers, but I would say that 
at least 80% of people already use it as medicine and know that it works better for them than any pharmaceutical. Day after day, people tout it as being life-saving or the best and only thing that works. People are always shocked when I ask them if they've ever had negative side effects with it. They look at me puzzled and say, with cannabis? <laughs> and uh, it's like, yeah, I have to ask that question. But working in this capacity in cannabis medicine has been eye-opening for me. I have come to greatly appreciate the innate wisdom and knowledge that patients have when it comes to their own bodies. While physicians may have a greater understanding of the inner workings of the body and mind, patients know their own bodies far better by simply feeling and living day to day. People by and large don't wanna be dependent on pharmaceuticals. A lot of people are scared of the chemicals and additives that are in prescription and over-the-counter drugs. People don't see the logic in the all too common practice of being prescribed a medication that causes side effects only to then be prescribed another medication to combat those side effects. Now that just doesn't make sense and it doesn't take a doctorate degree to see that clearly either. Practicing cannabis medicine has also shed a new light on the relationship of doctor to patient. And I think it's very empowering for patients when their own health and medicine can be put back in their hands. In general, people don't like being told what to do and too often the delivery from physicians is less than warm and coherent. With guidance and education, Patients can determine their own personal regimens that work best for them as it pertains to route of use, specific strains, and dosing methods. To bring this to a close tonight, as a bottom line, cannabis is transformative and healing across the spectrum, from the cellular and biochemical levels to the personal and interpersonal realms and to the communal and systemic levels. By legalizing medical cannabis here in Texas, it could begin to shift the dominant paradigm of our current profit and productivity driven system into an integrated holistic healthcare model that fosters a cooperative relationship between patient and physician while cultivating true health and medicine. I thank you for listening to my story and allowing me to share that with all of you tonight. Uh, take care and stay healthy and safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Uh viewers uh, tuning in right now, it takes a lot of courage to stand up for what you believe in. And it takes even more courage to stand up for cannabis in a state like Texas. So Dr. Jones, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your pe personal testimony with us this evening. I also wanna remind everyone that if you look down at the, there's a Q&A button, that at the end of this uh, virtual meeting, we will be doing questions and answers. So you can just hit that Q&A tab down at the bottom and submit your questions. So I didn't mention this earlier, but our two special guests this evening, they're our married couple. And, and it just so happens that we met on a very, very serendipitous way. We met on trying to get our land ready, prepped for organic, sustainable farming. So our next speaker, is uh, jo Mr. Joshua Jones. And Mr. Joshua jo Jones is a proud Army veteran, 25th Infantry Division Airborne, 25th Striker Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division. He replaced pharmaceuticals with cannabis therapy to heal with, with combat-related PTSD, TBI, and familial Mediterranean fever attended Southwest Conver uh, Conservation Corps, uh, also U.S. Forest Service Firefighter, the University of Washington Ethic Ethnic, Gender, and Labor Studies grad, International Qualitative Inquiry Congress researcher and participant with the University of Washington, Operations Assistant at One Love MMJ Dispensary, Kingston, Oklahoma, Treasurer of Redemption Farms, Cannabis Grow in Medill, Oklahoma. Advocate for Worker Cooperative Workplace Democracy. So make some noise in your, so your neighbors wonder what the heck you're doing. And here is Mr. Joshua Jones.
Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, CBD Genie. Uh, that was an amazing introduction. That was also amazing information on uh, the living microorganisms in soils and uh, their relationship uh, to us in that, you know, our health is interdependent on them considering uh, they're within everything that we consume. If uh, they're not full of those, of the proper nutrients, we ourselves suffer, no doubt. So thank you very much, CBD Genie, uh, for that amazing introduction, and Jillian, for you as well. That was an amazing and wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I think that we all know this here, but uh, cannabis has the power to, to heal, and it goes beyond the, the individual. With orga organizational structures that are rooted in cooperation and solidarity, we have the power to heal, transform, and to regenerate both our environment and our communities from the ground up, li quite literally. For many of you, and certainly for myself, cannabis has been life altering in a very positive way. I can't imagine life without it. But actually I can because I've been there. I was loaded down with uh, a heavy bag of pharmaceuticals that supposedly would help me with PTS and symptoms associated with TBI. But I didn't find any real relief in that. Cannabis is a plant for me that has fostered healing, solidar solidarity, and cooperation, uh, both in my marriage, but also as a parent, and even as a soldier in the minefields of Afghanistan. Further, it provides us an, an opportunity to extend our definitions of health, of solidarity, not just to our own selves or our families, but to our environment. However, it's up to us right now as this legalization process is unfolding to decide how we want to organize the production of our medicine as well as our cannabis health system. And I really think, I, I believe that the more that people are involved with cooperative and regenerative production of their medicines, the healthier they and the environment will be. Cannabis just works better this way. My individual environmental and community health are simultaneously improved when I take agricultural waste from stockpiles and move it into compost. This environmental waste is converted into nutrients which produce truly organic and living soils that in turn feed our medicine, delivering the greatest experience and relief. This is especially true when one gets the opportunity, or even better, when communities get to take part in these regenerative systems. I can say that the process for me has been healing. It has also caused me to broaden my definitions of health and healing. I ask myself, for, can, can health for me really be, be present when the consumption of my medicine was produced out of the pain and environmental destruction of the other's environment and their own livelihood? Can it really be that health is just a brown bag of pharmaceutical pills? For me and others like me, it doesn't work. In our health methodology, we hold that the health of the individual is interdependent on the health of the other. 
as well as the environment, both human and non-human alike. And I think that this is a good time as we bear witness to something now more than ever as we see that those that are considered the least in our communities are not only more severely affected, but also leave society more vulnerable as a whole. We know that in our communities, our, in our society as, as a whole in general, we produce a lot of waste. And in rural areas, agricultural waste, in addition to tons of other organic waste, such as food products that are destined for landfills or, or piles of manure that can leach excess nutrients into our water system, while at the same time creating harmful amounts of methane in our environment. The solution to these problems, to this problem, is composting. Compost, uh, composting allows us to remove this so-called waste from the equation by removing these items from stockpiles and landfills, which are large producers of methane and also hazardous to our water supplies. Utilizing composting, we can drastically reduce the amount of methane, carbon, and the leaching in our water systems by capturing and retaining these items within the soil. Before coming into contact with regenerative systems via academia and my work in the Conservation Corps and Forest Service, I first experienced them in the lush valleys of the Argandab River in Kandahar, Af Afghanistan. And while cannabis has the power to treat these symptoms that I suffer, for, suffer from, PTSD, TBI, it was actually the Afghan villagers themselves who showed me that it had the power to heal the conditions that can produce these systems whose origin was violence and force, something that they knew very well. Their solution to these problems was cooperation. They didn't have any industrialized food system with machines, chemical inputs or chain grocery stores, anything like that. They didn't have wait, a wage labor system because you can't eat money. Their political economy, though attacked by both the US and the Taliban, was based on cooperation and solidarity. Inequality didn't exist because inequality is opposite of solidarity. Every villager was a property owner and a producer. A local producer owner did not compete for the domination of a market share, but they pooled their resources and skills in cooperation to produce a variety of awesome products, including amazing hash. Wealth produced at markets was distributed through votes by producer owners and village elders in accordance with the needs of their village. It was really a marvel to see how nothing in their village went to waste. <clears throat> All of their food scraps, human and animal waste even, and other sorts of agricultural waste in general, were all communally collected and managed by local villagers. Children actually managed flocks of chicken for egg and meat production that were integrated within soil producing systems and different sorts of compost systems. Because chickens are really good at turning compost piles and they're also great fertilizers. So they would take these living soils and they would use these to amend traditional crops such as hash, okra, or pomegranates. We know, we've heard 
that ha that the Afghans are credited with being some of the best cannabis producers in the world. And it's definitely clear to me that their regenerative and cooperative methods have a lot to do with that. And I learned that great things start with the right organizational structures, just from the ground up, quite literally. And I would like to also say something in addition, uh, just in the spirit of the villagers, since they don't get to have a voice. They didn't have to provide a safe place for us. They didn't have to feed us or offer us amazing hash. They could have led us into minefield fields or killed us, but they wanted us to see that their experience and to listen to them. I was in shock and had to confront that I had been taught that these people hated me or that they were my enemy. And that wasn't further from the truth. Often, we would disregard our planned patrols to death traps in order to seek refuge with these folks. After a meal, we would gather around a council of elders to smoke and listen, to hear their side of this horrid chaos that we were all a part of. Sometimes they would cry, talking about all of the sons and daughters they lost from soldiers like me and many more from the Taliban, all for no good reasons. They would lament their circumstances, their, their state of being, being pinned between the U.S. and the Taliban, but mostly their traditional means of subsistence, their life of cooperation and connection with their land, with God, it was being ripped away by both. And they were very upset by that and certainly wanted to convey that to us. They wanted us to know. They wanted us to share this with you. They had a means of subsistence that was founded upon an awe and, and respect and a love of their collective home mediated through cooperation and it's our aspiration, and I know it's still theirs, the Afghans that I left behind, that taught me so much. And I understand that we aren't Afghans, and I know that we live in a very different world, but there are lessons we can learn from each other. And by moving beyond organic into regenerative systems, that are organized through cooperative, worker-owned, and democratically controlled businesses. It will enable us to increase our capacity for individual, community, and environmental health. Cannabis production founded on cooperation and solidarity starts from the ground up, literally right in the dirt and with a desire to commit a labor of love for somebody who you don't know, and a deep commitment as a caretaker of our most precious collective resource, our home and our, and our earth. I hope you guys join us and thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joshua for sharing the story, especially from the village. That was very powerful. Uh, I really appreciate that with all my heart. And thank you both for sharing your testimonies and your knowledge with us today. I also want to remind you all uh, tuning in that there's that little Q&A tab at the bottom. We will be having questions and answers at the end. So don't forget to submit there. At this time, I'd like to introduce one of the hardest working queens in the cannabis policy reform to update us with current events. Let's hear it for Texas Normal's Executive Director, Jax Finkel. Hello. Hi, Anita. Can you guys hear me okay? Are we good? We're good. All right. 
I get the thumbs up. We're good to go. All right. So um, first of all, thank you so much to Dr. Jones and to Joshua for talking to us about um, how we can work with our body and all of its systems and kind of treating our earth the same way. So um, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'm going to pivot to something a little bit different. We're going to talk about some political stuff that's coming up and um, some upcoming timelines. So first of all, it is 420 all month long. If you have not already celebrated today, maybe you will later. Uh, but April, we've started it off with two different things. Uh, the first one is an action alert that I want to tell you guys about. Um, we have an email campaign right now, and it's um, for Governor Abbott and our legislators, and it's focusing on specifically Governor Abbott's uh, emergency powers that he has and how he can affect public health and cannabis law at the same time. So we're asking for the governor to do a few things. The immediate action which is under his purviews, uh, his emergency powers, is to put a moratorium on all marijuana arrests. And people might ask, you know, why is that important? Well, first of all, we should not be putting any more people in jail when there is already concerns about COVID spreading throughout the jails. Our jails do not have need to have any more needless overcrowding. And in addition to that, um, there has been um, an argument that could be made that by uh, reducing interactions with officers that we can in reduce exchange, right? And according to this, about 80,000 people are charged for minor possession in a year. So that's 80,000 people interacting with law enforcement and um, other officers as they go through the process. And we found out that in Dallas, a detention officer and 10 mate, inmates have tested positive for COVID. In Houston, a man is positive, um, 30 are showing symptoms and 500 have been exposed. In San Antonio, we have an officer that tested positive and he was in contact with several colleagues and as many as 30 drivers um, through traffic stops. So I think that it's important that this is one more thing that we do not need to have officers wasting their time on. And in some cases they may already be doing that, but we definitely would like to see um, the governor address that as a public health issue. Um, additionally, the governor has the ability to call a special session. Um, he can do so at any time for any reason. He states his exact purpose in the proclamation when he calls the legislators to convene. Now, if and when it is safe to do so, we think that it's extremely important that Governor Abbott address two things through a special session or um, during the regular session, whichever may come first, depending on how everything plays out. But Number one, we need to make sure that we're allowing the legal sales of um, marijuana to adults over 21. Um, Texas has not usually had a lot of budgetary restraints or issues in the past, but it looks like uh, the COVID uh, hiatus in working and um, mass shutdowns in different areas are going to significantly impact our budget. And this might help offset extraordinary costs that, that are being induced through this. However, we do need to be mindful that um, we are being uh, thoughtful in the process and not um, being overly burdensome in taxation, but also recognizing that you know, up to a billion dollars could be made um, for estimated tax revenue here in Texas. And it could be Texas grown cannabis, Texas tested cannabis, could reduce uh, also some of the issues having to do with the public health um, surrounding some of the vaping issues uh, that we were seeing late last year. Additionally, we need to make sure that as soon as possible, we're uh, addressing expanding the Texas Compassionate Use Program. In many states, medical cannabis has been, been deemed essential, and it's become even more apparent that we need to make sure that we allow doctors to have flexibility in their dosing on what kind of cannabinoids and what percentages and dose that they want to see, that we can make sure that, um, I know Compassionate Cultivation has continued to do deliveries as an essential business, so I'm very happy to see that. We need to make sure um, that uh, licensed physicians such as Dr. Jones um, are able to prescribe, recommend, and really function easily underneath the program. So this is what the actions are that we're focusing on. You can go to texasnormal.org slash action dash safer dash TX um, and that will have there's one link to email the governor and then there's a secondary link that you can click on um, to email your personal Texas state representative and Texas senator. Um, so talking still about political things, we have the upcoming
Hey, Jax, can you hear me? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, maybe we lost Jax. It looks like she's frozen at the moment. Uh, Dr. Jones, can you hear me? So bear with us. This is definitely part of doing live streams and having um, everything come up and just playing it by ear and rolling with the punches. So and in the meantime, if I'm even live, hopefully you all can hear me. Yeah. Uh, we, can hear you. we can hear you. Oh, great. So yeah. we just we must have just lost uh, Jax. There she is. There you are. There she's back. Um, okay, great. One second. You're back. Yay. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry about that. Um, it seems like internets, everybody's on the internets. And so mine was like, you don't need to do a live stream. Um, <laughs> so I think that I was talking about primary elections, right? And how we have the Democrats and the Republicans, you decide during the primary election. And if you don't get over that 50% plus one line, then you go into a runoff election. And there's several dozen runoff elections across the state, um, both at the state and federal level. So the primary elections are going to be very interesting. Um, one that I know the cannabis community is very interested in and will probably be following closely is Pete Sessions out in the Waco area. He's um, going to uh, running or he did run and it's come to a runoff. So let me tell you guys about the dates because they have by proclamation in primary runoff election day. So you um, have early voting, which will begin on the uh, July 6th, and then primary runoff election day will actually be on the 14th. So those are gonna be um, the days for that. It's kind of a movement, uh, very flexible type situation that we have going on right now. Um, there's possibility of talks of doing mail-in ballot elections. Um, we're not really sure how these things might continue to change. <clears throat> so please stay tuned, we'll keep you updated. Another thing of note is that the political conventions, which through the political convention process is how you get platforms and platform planks, um, through that process, we have been able to have the Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians all having supportive planks having to do with cannabis law reform. Um, so the issue is that they might be moving them around. The dates are likely to change. They might be holding them virtual. So there's a lot of conversation that's happening right now about what's going to be um, happening with the convention process and how it's going to be hosted. So we will make sure to keep you updated that um, as, as much as we possibly can. As soon as we know, you will know. And then since we're kind of coming into this um, virtual state of being until who knows how long because we cannot do, uh, you know, big events, etc. We've decided um, the Texas Normal Patient Outreach uh, Group, they have all put together this great virtual meetup and we're going to be doing it on April the 25th at 1 p.m. We're going to have uh, Sherry, Brandon, and Akila all join but really walk through patient testimony and crafting your testimony. Right now, if, if you're stuck at home and you're looking for something to do, the best thing that we can do is go ahead and draft and create that one pager and make sure that um, you're giving it to us so that we can present it to legislators and really make sure that all of the voices from the patients are heard. Um, I know that right now can be kind of a difficult time for people, not only people who are accessing medicine on the legal market, but also the black market, times are very uncertain. And so um, I know that everybody's going through a lot. So our hearts are with you and hopefully you'll be able to join us virtually and we'll go over how to craft testimony. Um, I think that that's all that I have for now. I did want to note that on um, the Facebook live stream and on here on our webinar, we've had about 20-ish people on the live stream and we've had about 35, 30-ish here on the webinar. So that is pretty awesome. What I'm going to do now is um, turn it over to questions. Um, I see that we do have one typed in question here just for everybody um, 
down at the bottom. There's going to be a little chat bubble and it says Q&A and you can type in. Um, we've answered a couple questions there like how can you join? You can go to texasnormal.org slash join and you can become a member there. Um, and then also there's one here. Do you think there is any credence to the idea that legalization could be a tool to the government to combat the economic downturn caused by COVID-19? Um, so I'm totally full of opinions, uh, but, but I, I think I touched on it a little bit myself, but I'd like to see if Anita or Jillian or Josh have anything to add. Yeah, let's uh, let Joshua uh, tap in on that one. Um, if you want to go ahead and show your screen. I'm going to try to unmute him. Joshua. Whoops. Oh, no. There you go. Hi. There you go. We're all here. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think, yeah, I mean, certainly it would help, but definitely a lot more needs to be done. But uh, cannabis legalization would certainly help from an economic perspective. Uh, but at the same time, people do have to have uh, money in their pockets. Uh, but in, in tough times, you know, we rely on community and you know, there's there's other forms of, of currency, you know, in communities. Sometimes we do, you know, labor contracts, things like that. Gifts, that's always a great thing. Trade, exchange, there's those sorts of things. So uh, definitely, yes, it would help, but a lot more needs to be done. And the number that I mentioned, the one billion in, in tax revenue, was extrapolated off of um, Nevada's data. So that would be if um, a similar market in Nevada's was instituted in Texas. So that was an extrapolation. So that's how we estimated that that number. Uh, and that is that's a phenomenal amount of money that would that would incredibly help our communities. Absolutely. Yeah, that was with a B. Billion, not million, with a B. Yeah, a billion. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil. Um, so we have a question for Dr. Jones and Anita, uh, also known as CBD Genie, just so everybody's real clear on that. Are there any specific scientific studies you two have recently conducted on cannabis? Well, I can just say personally for myself, uh, having ulcerative colitis, I went out on a journey on my own as a guinea pig, as we all are, and uh, just did my due diligence and learned what the plant was all about, understanding the phytocannabinoids and the terpenes and just really getting into the nitty gritty of what the plant is capable of. And actually, while I was out on my journey, um, I happened to be in a legal state and I started to have symptoms of a flare up with my ulcerative colitis. And for the first time, I tried a cannabis suppository. So to say scientific studies, other than just on my own, I have witnessed, I have felt I have dodged the hospital. I have been able to bring my body to balance with cannabis. And most people think of smoking immediately. Um, for me, it was the other end and it helped me bring myself to balance. And that would be my personal cannabis testimony and scientific study. Dr. Jones, did you want to add something to that? Um, you know, I, I haven't done any formal studies. Um, I do want to say that this is off the topic, but I'm sorry that we've had issues with like faces in the camera um, and popping in and popping out. And like I said, it's the first virtual experience. So. No worries. You're we're, all, we're all kind of newbies in this territory. <laughs> my internet connection couldn't even handle it. So <laughs> yeah. I realized my talk I was posting like that. <laughs> Oh no. You're but, good. We all heard you. Thank you. That's great. I was relieved, Jax, when the videos didn't work initially. I was like, 
<laughs> <laughs> um, but sorry, to answer the question, I have not done any kind of formal studies other than, you know, just kind of personal um, experimentation. And I mean, one thing we have done, you know, some experimentation with Joshua's disease. He has a, an inflammatory disorder called familial Mediterranean fever. So uh, we've experimented, you know, with RSO and you know, just different formulations and different dosages and mixed with his colchicine, you know, using it side by side, the pharmaceutical, but um, no, no formal studies. Right. I do know, I do know that, um, that folks come in the dispensary, one love alternatives and uh, utilize the, they sell this uh, suppositories there and patients do come in and, and use those. So I'm not for sure what any kind of specific conditions, but if other, if other people are using them, they're, they're working for things. We certainly know that. Yeah, and actually there's a question here. Um, somebody says, I work for CBD boutique and I see hurting people all day long who trust me with their care and to lower their dependence on medications. Can we share stories from our customers? Um, so first of all, I think, uh, the CBD um, stores, it's pretty interesting what's going on right now. You know, Dallas County deemed them um, not essential. And there are some people that are pushing back on that and arguing that, in fact, many people are accessing um, their therapeutic supplements, you know, through, through that avenue. And so I think that that's a an interesting take to make, especially when our medical program is so limited. A lot of people really do um, rely on the retail avenues for, give it, for giving it. But then what I wanted to answer was the question about can you share their stories? So first of all, I would say you would always want to get permission before sharing someone's story. Um, if you use it anonymously with, you know, no notation of who they are, you know, perhaps you, you could get away with that. But I would advise you know, having them join us on the crafting testimony and have them actually put together their testimony. And then if you want to use it, um, you can ask them for permission. They can allow that. So I think that that would be a good way of incorporating the feedback you hear from your patients and also allowing it to have an impact up at the Capitol. Um, I see the, the next question on here. It says, do you have any advice to someone who is wanting to advocate but also retain a professional reputation? And honestly, I battled with that myself uh, uh, three years ago, in fact, working in a clinical lab in the microbiology department. Obviously, here in Texas, I was terrified to speak up. I didn't want to tell anyone anything because in the fear of getting fired, uh, how am I going to survive? How am I going to pay my bills? You know, just my reputation, right, to just get flushed down the drain after the all the hard work of, you know, being in the military and going to school and all this and then for it to just get washed out. However, like I had just mentioned with my cannabis testimony, once that happened, once I realized the facts and the truth and the fact that it's unethical that we do not have access here, I understood that I was fighting the good fight. And even though I was putting everything on the line, I knew that I just wanted to just do the right thing. So to answer your question, it is scary at first for sure. And there, if you can't speak up, Texas Normal is obviously a very amazing organization to be a part of, to just be a part of a community or just to reach out to, to share your stories or to get involved in any way. Um, but please keep in mind, this is the facts and it is difficult to stand up for what you believe in in the state like ours, but this is the right thing. And we are leading with science. And if you have information like patent 6630507, if you understand, you know, uh, medications like Marinol that are the synthetic replica of THC that have been given to cancer patients for decades, 
if you know the facts and you really have a strong defense, then do it and stand up for it because this is what we need to do in order to make change is to educate and continue to put our stories out there. I mean, I don't know. I'm talking to a microbiologist and a neurologist, and I think that that is pretty professional. And I think that it, we need to also within ourselves break that stigma that if you come out and you talk about it, that you're going to be maligned in some way. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but by continuing for us to stay in the closet, it does allow for people to not have that perception broached. You know, people are professional, they're taxpayers, they're homeowners, they're parents, they're doctors. You know, these are the people that use cannabis, whether it be therapeutically, although some people argue you have an ECS, so any cannabis use could, could be somewhat therapeutic, right? But no matter what reason you use it for, um, you can still be a really professional, upstanding person that's taken very seriously. And we have done a lot of work to try to change that stigma. Um, you know, cannabis culture is amazing and I love the culture and we have a great family and a great community, um, but everybody who consumes cannabis is not what you view as the stereotypical cannabis user. So um, I would just add that. Yes. And there's actually a question for Josh, unless uh, Dr. Julian, did you have anything else to add on, on that last question? No, nope, I'm just sitting weird in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there, this is from Trish. Um, she, she is using rotted horse manure on her garden, but worries about how the chemicals in the horse feed might impact the quality of the soil. Do you know anything about what harmful elements might be present? Hmm, I'm not for sure. It could be, it might be something like, I would check moisture content. That's something that, that I would check. If you have rot, then check your moisture content, you know, and I would ask, is it wet? You know, is what you have wet? And if you're getting a lot of rot, check moisture and also check the amount of manure that you have those two things I would say scale back on both of those to make it more dry yeah exactly to make it more dry yeah and less uh nitrogen content I'm just like rotted and manure mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah great yeah. yes <laughs> yes chickens in my backyard and we compost and what we often do is we take the compost that they you know they can't consume and we'll mulch it through a couple times and then we'll put it in the pen with them they scratch through make it all lovely and then we oh. put it on the garden my yeah. husband does these things i don't do these things that's <laughs> it you're doing it you guys are practicing it that's amazing that's really cool Awesome. Well, you know, I think that we, oh, you know, I'm just going to make one quick note. Um, Nisha says to Trish, sometimes Roundup can be in conventional horse feed. So maybe oh, do a little God. bit of research on the type of horse feed that the horse is having if you have access to that information. Yes. Good point. Good point. Organic, organic horse feed. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we have gone through the questions online and the questions here on the webinar. Um, any final thoughts from everyone? No, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad you all were able to join us today. This has been awesome. And I mean, what a great learning experience. You put yourself out there. Congratulations. You're doing the right thing. We're all in the right place at the right time. So just continue to keep moving forward and, and, and educating because it took a lot of work for people to believe what we believe today, right? So we just need to put in that same amount of work, education, leading with science, having doctors, letting the public know, because a lot of people really confide in physicians. So you have a very big responsibility because they're going to be coming to you. So thank you so much for stepping up, both of you. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And before we end this recording, I just want to um, thank Anita for being our MC. We do this really cool thing where we all kind of take turns.
it gives us all this great different content. So I'm very grateful for Anita bringing both of you here and y'all spending your time with us. But I also want to mention, you know, typically we host these meetings at Flamingo Cantina. It's an iconic vintage Austin place. And currently, of course, because of the COVID-19 crisis, they are shut down. And we won't be there in May either because the shutdown has been scheduled through May 4th. Um, but we are thinking of them. And if you are missing having the Mau Mau chaplains in your life and some of their reggae happening in your ears, then you can actually go to their Facebook page and they're doing a live stream right now. So oh, cool. I just wanted to give a shout out to them. They've got a GoFundMe going on to help keep their doors open. And mm -hmm. once this whole hot mess is over with i hope we can all meet up there and have really big hugs that would be really amazing so Yay. i want to say thank you and to everybody watching thank you so much and stay safe out there